Um, welcome to the Knoxville Writers Guild, which has been helping writers improve and market their writing skills for almost 30 years. We're really glad to have you with us tonight. If you see somebody you know here, you know, follow up with them later if you can. Um, looking ahead, we hope you will join us on June 3rd when Terry Faulkner, a local historian, and her husband Charles Faulkner, an archaeological historian, um, will discuss finding and writing local history. They, uh, they figured out something that had been misstated for decades. So, um, And then on June 19th, poet Charlotte Pence will lead a workshop about how to end our prose and poems. And she's a pretty big deal poet. She's, she's writing pretty high right now. She's a good teacher. Um, sign up for these at knoxvillewriterskill.org. And now our webmaster, the man behind the logo, Kaifel Agostini, will introduce tonight's speaker. Kaifel. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, my friend, um, for quite some years, um, is the Senior Associate Director of the Carter Center, Rosalind Center Fellowships for Mental Health Journalism and Media. Uh, she was previously a staff writer and executive producer and senior manager of digital content for the Cox Media Group newsrooms across the US, a graduate of the Yale University Thread Media Storytelling Program. Carrie has written for Vox, Huffington Post, uh, MSNBC, Pointer, The Trinidad Guardian, Kirby and Beat, She Magazines, and most recently, The New York Times. Uh, she's a TEDx speaker and holds a master's, degree, a master's degree in mass communications from University of Central Florida. Uh, she is probably one of the brightest people that I know and I'm proud to have her here. Thank you, Kaifel. I did pay Kaifel to say all of that, just so everybody <laughs> knows. I Venmoed him $10 yesterday and said, say nice things. So thank you for that. Send me an additional invoice tomorrow if you save more things. Um, so I am grateful to be here today um, to, to talk to all of you about writing about mental health and about uh, protecting your own mental health because it can be such a tough topic, um, not just to live through in your own life, but also as you write about it in your stories and you try to process some complicated things to shape characters on the page who are living with mental health challenges. So. I am grateful to be here today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. Uh, Kaifel, I am still a participant, so I can't share my screen. All right, I am the host now. So quick, all right. Hold on a sec, folks. I just need to find the right window. All right, here we go. All right, please let me know. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Yep. All righty. All right, so as Kaifel said, I'm the Senior Associate Director of the Rosalind Carter Fellowships for Mental Health Journalism and Media. And I'm happy to be here with you today. We'll be looking at some practical ways to build your resilience um, and uh, some tips on writing about mental health. I'm not a mental health professional, so we're not gonna be getting into any clinical aspects of mental health and trauma, but I am a journalist and a writer and I've been working at the intersection of news and mental health for a while. And I've learned a thing or two on this journey that I hope will benefit you. 
So before we actually get into today's session, I just wanted to start with a little bit of grounding. So we're gonna do a quick breathing exercise. I don't know if um, you're familiar with 478 breathing, but it uh, kind of focuses your mind and your body on regulating your breath rather than focusing on your worries or letting those worries sit in your body. Uh, people usually use it to sleep, but I've found that it actually helps me throughout the day if I just need to take a beat. So we're gonna go through three rounds of um, a four, seven, eight breathing. You can close your eyes, you can leave them open and focus on something, um, but it'll just get us into the moment. So let's breathe in for four, three, two, one, hold for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, exhale for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, breathe in for four, three, two, one, hold for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, exhale for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, breathe in for four, three, two, one, hold for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, exhale for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit around language and destigmatizing mental health, especially in our writing. And then we'll talk a little bit about building resilience and some strategies for you. So before we get into that, I'm gonna lay some ground provisions. Um, I'm from Trinidad, so ground provisions are like the basics of the meal, like cassava, yam, potatoes, the things that you grow in the ground that really help carry the meal. So let's lay some ground provisions right now. Um, thank you for welcoming me into your home. I recognize that I am in your home. And um, so if you wanna keep your video off, that's fine. If you wanna keep your video on, that works too. Um, mute yourself if you're not speaking. I know we've been in the pandemic for over a year. So we think we're used to it until you realize you try to speak and then you're on mute or vice versa. So mute yourself when you're not speaking, unmute if you wanna speak. Um, if you're an extrovert um, and you tend to talk a lot and just recognize that as we get to the end and step back to give other people a chance, um, but you're probably like me based on the fact that most of us are writers right now. So you're probably introverts like me. So when we get to this section where we have some conversation and we chat amongst ourselves, uh, push yourself to step up if you don't usually step up to speak. Um, and this is a space for vulnerability. We'll be talking about mental health. I mean, I went on a stage and told people all of my business in a TED talk. So um, this is a space where we can share and talk about some challenges around mental health if you feel as comfortable to do that. So we have all been dealing with a lot for the last 15 months. I know this week for the first time in 15 months, I've been in this house with an eight-year-old and a three-year-old and they, one has been in virtual school. I've been working full-time and it has just been, I can't describe it. So this is the first week that they've been back in school, both of my kids, now that we're vaccinated. And so that's been on my mind this week. So I wanna ask you really quickly, you know, you can weigh in on the chat or you could just unmute yourself and share what is one thing that's been on your mind today briefly? I'll say something. Hi, uh, decompressing from the week. There's been a lot of deadlines and challenges um yeah so letting it go <laughs> thank you for sharing that anybody else uh i'm on vacation but it's um we are preparing 
to move across the country in five weeks. So there's a lot of just general generalized, oh my God, we're moving across the country in five weeks. All right, the second statement nullified my jealousy over the first statement. Got it. <laughs> All right. I, I would say uh, I had a, I'm the building manager of the building I live in. And, we had an inspection today for our fire alarm system. And uh, it's sort of like your kids being gone. Uh, now, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure I know how to act anymore. I, I've never know whether I'm supposed to have my mask or not have my mask. And when somebody comes in from the outside who doesn't share the same maybe values I have about it. And then when I go out somewhere, it's all so fluid now that things are supposedly opening up. And, you know, we've been in lockdown, but it's, it's all different and I don't know how to act. I feel you on that one. I don't think I know how to people. I didn't know how to people before, but now it's like just an extra cool bucket of water. And I, I see some stuff in the chat. Deborah is learning to get back in public and socializing. Yep right there with you, Sharon. You get to see your sister and her kids after two years. Oh my gosh. Um, someone someone gave me a typewriter and I'm looking forward to a retro quieter way of communicating. You know what? I collect antique typewriters. <laughs> so I have typewriters all over my house. And this week I got a surprise note in the mail from a friend of mine who pulled out his typewriter and typed me a full letter um, typewriters from 1982 and he typed a letter for me on the typewriter so it was nice it was nice to get something like that so yay typewriter people all right <laughs> let me just minimize that chat real quick all right so words matter when it comes to destigmatizing mental health and um, you know, I think us as writers tend to know that, but we also sometimes forget it, or we fall into patterns that um, of language that are traditionally used instead of what might be appropriately used. And our words have power because we have ink and we have um, the muse. And so it's so important the way that we think about mental health, the way that we speak about it, and the way that we write about it, and the way, because that is what our readers take away from us. And so I'm gonna play a really short section of my TED talk that addresses this, and then we're gonna come back. Can you see, still see my screen? Okay. Carrie, we have no sound. Okay, let's fix that. Health. What do we say? All right, thumbs up if you can hear it, okay? And the language that we use to talk about such a common challenge matters. When we talk about mental health, what do we say? What if we change the way that we talk about mental health. We say committed suicide or that someone was committed to a psychiatric facility. But what else do we commit? Crimes, right? We say someone is suffering from depression. And yes, it is a hard and a fluid place to be, I know. But how would it shape our perception if we said living with instead? We say someone is bipolar or schizophrenic, but what does that do? It labels them. 
It defines them by their condition instead of as someone living with the condition. We say substance abuse, but is it really abuse if addiction is a disease of the brain that drives usage regardless of circumstances? The words that you hear and the words that you use shape your perception. They can lift or break someone in a moment like telling someone, maybe they just needed more friends. So I wanted to share that. Are you seeing my other screen back now? Okay, I wanted to share that because it touches on I think one of the most important things about communicating about mental health and mental illness is that the way that we think about it and the way that we speak about it and the way that we write about it has such a huge impact on perception and on stigma. And so, you know, some of the best practices around it are saying that someone is living with a condition versus suffering from the condition, um, saying that someone died by suicide and not committed suicide, that a person has a mental illness, has the diagnosis, for example, a person with schizophrenia, not schizophrenic. Um, about a year and a half ago, I did mental health first aid training where they teach you basically how to administer first aid, but in a mental health scenario. So instead of um, doing tourniquets and, and doing CPR and all of that, you learn how to talk someone basically, you know, for lack of a better description, off of the ledge until professional help can arrive. And the woman who was teaching the course said um, she had a nephew who was 10, who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And the adults in his life kept telling him that he was bipolar. And so he started describing himself that way in conversations with people offhandedly. So he would say, um, he would say, I really love to read books, but um, I can't seem to stick with the same book for a long time, but that's just because I'm bipolar. So he would like, couch basically he would start he did start to define who he was by the condition because people said that he was bipolar and kids take it literally right and so that's how he started thinking of himself now if the folks around him had described it as um he was diagnosed with this or he is living with this he would have a different perception of it. But as a child, that's how he picked it up. And I thought it was such a perfect example of, of, of the kind of impact that the words can have without us even knowing it. Because we're so used to saying alcoholic, schizophrenic, um, describing people in a certain way, instead of recognizing that, there is, that it is a condition separate from who they are, right? And so that's why we talk about a person who has um, a, a substance use disorder rather than an alcoholic. Or, um, you know, when I talk to journalists, we talk about including the importance of including recovery stories and context. So instead of just like focusing on the fact that this issue exists, also incorporating the fact that recovery is possible. And journalism is a little bit different in that you can get multiple sources to show these different. Did she freeze? Perspective. I think we need to present is this to my story. Can you all hear me okay? I missed some of that because you froze. I don't know if it okay. happened to others as well. 
it yeah i just got a, an alert that said my internet connection was low so where did you lose me let's see about the uh, living with a condition versus defining oneself as having it uh, okay. and the, the same would be true i presume for the family uh because <laughs> they're also living with it <laughs> but yeah right um and and we in, you know, when I talk to journalists, I, we also talk about um, including recovery, perspectives of recovery in the stories so that they don't just focus on, on the issue, but that they show that recovery is possible or that help is possible and providing context around that. I think for us, if we're writing fiction, we're trying to craft characters with mental illnesses or we're writing nonfiction and we're trying to, um, describe someone who lives with a mental illness, we can still provide that kind of context, but we have to ask how relevant is this condition to the story? And if I'm imbuing someone with this, with a character with, with a mental illness, am I doing them justice? Am I being fair? Is this, a, is this an approach that tells the story of the whole person or does the person become their the mental illness that 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 we want to include with them? Um, so I'm a big advocate for person first language, um, describing people not by their condition but by who they are and as living with the condition. Um, you'll typically find that in the mental health community, in the disability community. Um, it's it's a little bit different. Folks tend to um, be a little bit be okay. folks tend to be okay with being more direct about conditions and saying yes, you can say I'm disabled, etc. So in that case, like I would um, I would always suggest if you're interviewing someone to get a characterization right, or if you are writing about someone to ask how they prefer to be identified or how do they want their, their mental illness or their condition to be defined. And some people will say, it's okay to, it's okay to describe me this way, or I would, I would prefer if you describe me in this way. But generally speaking, um, in the mental health community, we, we push for person first language because someone is a person first before they had their condition or before they live with the condition, they are more than their condition. So one second, let me just fix something here. All right, so I'm gonna shift a little bit to building your resilience. Um, and I wanted to cover that because I think that so many of us have been through a lot in the last year, um, and and at least for me, I have done a lot of processing through writing, um, and and I think as writers we tend to internalize a, a lot more a lot more deeply than than other folks because we process our emotions through the words, and so I wanted to touch a little bit on on building our resilience in light of the last year. So one of the first things that I, that I recommend that folks do is just doing a self-check with how you've been feeling lately and asking yourself some questions around, you know, am I, you know, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an introvert, right? So I, I'm not, I'm not um, I don't connect with people all the time, but but with the people that you connect with, are you isolating instead of connecting them? Are you enjoying the things you usually do? How is your sleep? Are you crying? Um, is it hard to concentrate? Do you dread work? I think that a lot of us would look at these questions and be like, yes, I'm actually feeling like that right now because it's been a tough year, right? Um, but, you know, I think it's important for you to check in with yourself to see where where am I in this moment to try to identify where you are. And Kaifel, I can't see the chat right now um, just because I have like speaker view and too many things going on on my laptop.
but there's a link in my speaker notes to uh, a story that I wrote on trauma. If you have a chance to drop it in the chat, that includes some of the questions here on the self check in case you wanted to go through them yourself at, at a later point. So understanding trauma, what is trauma and, and how does it affect you? And I think in the past, right? In the past, the, pre, the before COVID, the, the before times, we looked at trauma as an emotional response to an event. And this year has been a little bit different in that it's been a prolonged trauma over the past you know, year and, and change. And I think especially for if you're in, if you're part of specific groups, like if you're an immigrant or if you're a person of color in the US and you're watching racial violence and um, you're watching and it, things happening to people in your community that are painful and you're experiencing that, that's all very traumatic. So I think like this year, this past year has been a culmination of so many things. Um, and so it's been a long-term trauma. And you can connect trauma so much to your physical body and where you actually feel your trauma. So we don't necessarily have to do this now, but if you have a little notebook and you're taking notes, um, take a note of an exercise to do later on of think of, identifying trauma within your body and where your feelings show up. So think of something that makes you happy and like genuinely blissfully happy and see where you feel that feeling. And for me, that is in my stomach, right? And then think of something that you are not happy about, that you absolutely dread and think about where you feel that. And you know, for me, that's in my chest. For you, it might be somewhere else. Um, but you're, sometimes, but oftentimes your body will know how you're feeling before your brain even catches up. So you can do that quick little self-check exercise about where am I right now? Am I feeling stressed out? Am I tense? Am I feeling it here? Am I feeling it in my chest? Um, it's definitely not a happy feeling. What kind of feeling is it? So if you can start off by identifying where your joy sits and where your pain sits or your dread sits or the negativity sits, that helps you identify it. And identifying it is such an important step. So professional help. Um, professional help looks different for everybody. Um, I do talk therapy and that works great for me. I also have a life coach. Some folks, uh, have have psychiatrists, some folks are on medication. I'm on medication. I find it in, incredibly helpful, but it looks different for everyone. And so there's a lot of stigma and shame around seeking help. And um, but sometimes your life depends on it, right? And so finding the thing that works for you is also really important to keeping you going disconnecting has been, oh, you know, sometimes the news can just get really overwhelming or just, you know, scrolling on social media. If you're on, if you're unfortunate enough to be on social media, um, can be a lot overwhelming, right? And so disconnecting from that, ex from disconnecting from that and focusing your energy and your time on the things that bring you joy, like reading a book, like writing for writing's sake, um, like focusing on your family in, in specific moments or cooking, whatever it is that bring you joy, disconnecting from the things that bring you down is so important. And I think we define so much of who we are by what we do and how productive we are and how we're keeping up with everything and everybody in our lives. But, you know, the always on thing you can go back to how you're feeling. And, and when you're always on, for me, I can feel it in my chest and I know that it's time to step away. So you are not the work that you do. And it is possible to do the work and not lose yourself in the process. So when you're off, 
be off and process things online and take a break and invest that time in your mental health. Um, do what's in front of you. One of the most important lessons that I learned um, while I was in the midst of a long-term trauma that I will talk about in a little bit is to just do what's in front of you because there are gonna be days when you wake up and you don't wanna get out of bed or you don't wanna take a shower and it can just be, okay, I'm awake now and I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go eat. Okay, I'm tired now, so I'm gonna go sleep. Okay, I smell, it's time to take a shower, I'm gonna do that. Okay, I'm thirsty, I'm gonna hydrate. And sometimes it's just like taking that one extra step and taking that one extra step and taking that one extra step without thinking about all of the other things that helps keep you going. So this is my son. This, his name is Liam. He is not so little now, but this was in 2017 when he was born. And just by the numbers, he spent, he was born at 33 weeks. He was measuring at 29. He spent 22 days in the NICU. Uh, I made 96 doctor's visits when I was pregnant with him. I gave myself 360 self-administered shots to keep him alive. Um, he was on an apnea monitor after he was released from the NICU for 158 days. And every time he stopped breathing, it would go off. <laughs> And so it was in the midst of this prolonged trauma and then he was isolated at home for a long time. And it was in the midst of this prolonged trauma that it was like, I don't know when this is going to end. And there is so much uncertainty and I don't know how this is going to end. I don't know if he's going to be okay. I don't know if we're gonna be intact as a family. And um, I was talking to my therapist and she said, what, you know, you're gonna have to go get through to the other side. There's no, there. that's just what it is. Just like this pandemic, we're gonna have to get through to the other side and hope that we make it. There is no other choice, right? And she asked, what's one thing that you do every day that makes you feel a little bit better? And I said, it was taking a hot shower. Um, and she said, okay, well, how long do you take a hot shower? I said, five minutes. She said, okay, well then just take a hot shower for 10 minutes. And it was like this revelation of like her giving me an extra five minutes permission to do something for myself, but not just that. It was like, I had built up in my head this idea of what self-care and took taking care of myself looked like. And that there was, you know, money attached to it or that there was this, significant amount of time and energy that I didn't have that was attached to it. And then boiling it down to the basics of just take an extra five minutes in the shower. And like, that's how I survived. That's how I survived 248 days in isolation in, in 2017 was taking a 10 minute hot shower every day. So my question to you is, what is that one thing every day that makes you feel a little bit better? And can you do an extra five minutes of it? And Liam is three years old now, and he is healthy and thriving and wonderful. Just, you know, breaking news update on where this child is. He is great. Um, but going through that experience with him and as a family and having a medically fragile child taught in a way prepared us to deal with the pandemic and in a way taught us to live through trauma, to see the other side. And there is another side. So in Burnout, um, I don't know if anybody's read Burnout. It's a book by Emily Nagoski and Amelia Nagoski. And they talk about the stress cycle and about how it lives in the body and the importance of completing the cycle and where the stress goes if you don't complete the cycle. And I can personally attest to where the stress goes because stress sent me to the ER at one point because I was not acknowledging it. And so don't let 
your depleted body force that pause on you. Completing the stress cycle just means finding a release for that stress in whatever way you can. And, you know, I have a very entertaining three-year-old. So sometimes he'll make me laugh at the end of, at, during the day. Um, and that's enough to release the stress. Sobbing in the shower, done that quite a bit. You know, hugging people if we live with people and we're and it's safe to do so. Doing a breathing exercise like we did earlier, getting creative and just writing for writing's sake. I have a little, um, I have a journal that I jot my thoughts and feelings in, you know, intermittently, and that helps a lot. Taking a walk, spending time with pets and plants. These are all important ways to complete the stress cycle, right? One of the things that really struck me early on last year, probably when we were about two months into this thinking, oh my gosh, when is it going to end? <laughs> um, and had no idea that it was gonna go on this long is one of my good friends who is a journalist and she just published a book uh, called Girlhood that features the stories of girls from around the world as told in their own voices. I was like, I feel like I should be writing more. I feel like I should be pitching more. I feel like my house should be clean or I should be cooking more balanced meals or I should be exercising, da, da, da. And she stopped me and she said, whoa, we're in the middle of something like we have never experienced before. And there are no shoulds right now. There are no shoulds. And that phrase carried me through the last year because the second that I stopped being compassionate toward myself about what I was and not was accomplishing and was not accomplishing and watching friends publishing books um, that I couldn't even get to mine or you know reading books by friends who have published and and happy for them and wishing that I could get to that point I would just remind myself that there are no shoulds and we're all doing the best we can with what we have. Um, so I wanna quickly wrap up before we move on. Um, we talked about that one thing and, and I think your village is also incredibly important and leaning on people who get it, who understand the work that you do, who understand the person that you are and your dreams and what the last year has done to that. And, um, you know, being mindful of self-medicating and how much is too much. And if you're dependent to the point where you might need to talk to someone. So um, I just threw a lot at you kind of quickly, but I wanted to leave a lot of time at the end so that we could chat about maybe some of what I just said or your thoughts around the topic and just have a conversation. So I know we're slated to end around eight, maybe a little bit after, because I know we started late, but I wanted to throw things back out to you to see if you had any questions or if you had any comments and let's have a discussion. I should have planted someone, shouldn't I? I well, I'm I, gonna jump in. Oh, sorry. No, I just, um, I kind of had a question. How do you approach, how would you suggest that people approach talking about like a specific um, mental illness in their writing? Because um, like I um, suffer at, from OCD and so does my dad. And um, you live with OCD, right? Yes, yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> See, <laughs> but no, we do it all the time. I do it too sometimes. It's just and now it's I'm apologizing, and now I'll think about that later. Um, <laughs> but uh, so with as somebody living with that, that is like a tr it gets used as a trope mm -hmm. in writing constantly and in the way people speak and when they mean organized or when they mean um, a specific. And they say that and it's so triggering. And um, 
and I, I, but I feel like at the same time, there's this resistance to not using that language in the sake of, for the sake of, you know, not being too overly sensitive or I, I don't, I guess what I'm, I'm not sure what I'm asking. It's like, how do you approach that? Especially as somebody maybe who doesn't have that diagnosis. I don't know if that makes sense. Do you mean, how do you approach writing about it or how do you yeah. approach talking to someone about it? Writing about it specifically. Okay. So, you know, I think you would treat it like you would treat any research exercise, right? And um, you're writing about a place, you research that place if you're not able to actually physically go there. And if you're writing about a condition, you sit with someone with that condition and, and basically conduct an, a sensitive interview. And I talked to a peer counselor a couple of years ago and she said one of her, one of the, she, um, she lives with depression and she also counsels people with depression. And she said one of the, one of the things she appreciates when people ask is what happened to you? Tell me your story. And that removes the guilt and the responsibility from the person with the condition. So instead of like um, making them feel like it's their fault, you're asking them to share their story with you. And so, you know, you do the interview to ask them and you ask them the, the, for the information that you're looking to find out, like, you know, what, what are your, what is it like living with this condition? What are the stigmas that you experience? Like, what are the symptoms that you experience, et cetera, et cetera, to get a full picture and interviewing like more than one people because, you know, conditions are multidimensional will give you an idea of like, not just the facts of describing it, but also how people feel when you write about the condition. So, you know, involving people with lived experience in your storytelling will help not just better inform your storytelling, but make it more empathetic and accurate. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that question. That was a good question. So um, I will honestly say that without my therapist, I don't think I would have gotten through 2020. 2020 was hard for me on a number of levels, uh, personally and professionally. So I have encouraged everyone to, there are two things that have encouraged people. If you need help, ask for it. Uh, find a mental health professional uh, that you can talk to and get through it. And remember everything, you can do it in tiny bits. If it looks like, uh, I was talking to Lisa and she had this batch of transcripts and she hates doing transcripts. And I was like, take all of them except for one and put them in a drawer. And you have one transcript to do, get it done. And then, so whatever it is, no matter how insurmountable it seems, one at a time, one tiny piece at a time, one tiny bit, tiny bite at a time, and it will get you through, which is pretty much how I got through therapy and tiny bites 2020 yeah and you know Kaifel the thing is that like I think everyone is kind of emotionally overloaded right now because as we shared in the beginning one of the reasons that I ask at the beginning what are what's on your mind this week is that uh I see variety of responses and everybody in the room sees a variety of responses. So sometimes there are funny responses. There are people who are dealing with some really tough shit, pardon my French. Um, there are people who are wrestling with some stuff and everyone exists in their own universes, but we all have different things going on. And so if, of all of the years, this has been the toughest year to even reach out to people and lean on people because everybody is carrying so much. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why, you know, therapy has been so helpful because you don't feel like you're offloading and burdening someone um, who is already carrying a lot because you're paying a professional to help you through it, right? So 
Yes, agree, completely agree with you, Kai Flo, on that. Um, what I have to say is part comment and part, you know, see if you have any views on this as well. I, I was part of the AARP town hall call today, which I've been listening into, even if I don't feel like I need it, um, partly just to see what they're saying and what are the questions and the concerns by basically older Americans. And um, one of the, I'll just cut to the chase of one of the suggestions or, or what the, 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 the professional responded with was to remind people that they um, are older and have resilience by the experience that they have from their life and to remember that um, in order to respond to stressful times uh, to, to that you may have actually already processed something as stressful when you were younger and here you stand today. So it was this kind of thing of like, it's a kind of similar to identifying uh, a condition or an issue was also to identify the qualities and strengths that you have to marry with those challenging moments. And, and that was what actually made me feel like I wish to want, I want to write a pamphlet, you know, something you could hand out to your friends who are, you know, th that would be kind of neutral in tone, but it'd be a way to remind, reminders, friendly reminders. Um, so I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that people are multidimensional and their mental health conditions are just one dimension of a whole person. So yes, you're writing about mental health and, and including someone's condition, but it involves so much more, you know, not just the negative aspects of it that we are used to hearing about, um, but also the things that make them them. So yeah, I think you're, you're on point with that. Do we, uh, Kari, do we, do you, in your group down there, do you all have any research or anything that helps people to know? I guess I wonder about writers. Uh, we, we sometimes think that uh, it, if we're going to write about a trauma, it might be cathartic, it might be good for us. But also we're afraid that writing about some trauma might be bad for us. Do we know whether it's good or bad for us or any markers that help us decide whether or not to delve into some things? Um, I, that's a good question. I don't, have, I don't have research on my fingertips to give to you to say like, you know, definitively it helps to write about things or, or like you should stay away from it because it's just gonna you're just gonna make you relive the trauma. I think we deal with, with trauma in different ways. Um, what I do think though, is that even if you don't deal with trauma, it's still there, it will still be there. Um, so whether it is writing about it or talking about it, or you know trying to address it professionally, it needs to be dealt with. Um, personally, like I do a lot of processing my trauma through writing and some of it makes absolutely no sense and that's fine because nobody's ever gonna see it. <laughs> um, and some of the things that I write about the traumas in my life, I publish and some I don't. Um, but I personally have found it draining to write about it, but also helpful because I find some release in that. Um, and also in sharing it, it helps other people who are, have gone through or who are grappling with similar traumas who are trying to make sense of it to see, okay, I'm not alone in this. Somebody else is dealing with this or has dealt with this. Um, and it's good to see that. So, you know, I wouldn't say if writing about your trauma makes you feel awful, then you should write about it. Um, I would say if it if it helps you, then do it. Um, 
if it if it helps you process how you're feeling, then do it. Um, but if writing does not help you, then I would say like at least find some way to process it because the further you run away from the trauma, the heavier it gets um, and it stays with you. You know, that's how generational traumas get passed down. And, um, and we don't want that. We don't want that for the two generations beyond us that we helped birth. But you know what, Bob? Let me look up and see if I could find research on it and I'll send it. Because I bet you there's a graduate assistant somewhere in my program that will find research <laughs> for us. Kind of following up on what Bob said, um, contrary to what everybody else has been going through this year, 2020 was actually a pretty good year for me. And I'm a COVID survivor, so that was a pretty good thing. But the years leading up to that really sucked for a lot of ways. And they just, it just, it wasn't one big trauma. It was just one thing after another. And I've been writing a memoir, which is not really about me. And I've got a couple of my critique group on this call. Um, and I'm trying to not have the focus on me so much, but I go back and I read some notes and things I made about that time. Even if it's a happy memory, it's like I, my chest gets tight and I'm like, oh, I don't want to read this. I don't want to write it up. And then once I write it, it's okay. But it's like, it's really hard looking back on some of the notes and not, and dealing with what happened back then. Cause it's like, I'm back in that situation. So that, that makes it hard. Sometimes I just have to get up and, and walk away. And um, sometimes I think my memory has helped me out. I, I ran across one that I had written back in 2011. I was robbed at gunpoint and I don't remember it. I cannot remember a thing about it. And I know I didn't make it up. So I don't know where it went in my psyche, but it disappeared. Because mm. I found it written about. And uh, it was just kind of interesting which really doesn't have a lot to do with my story, but I may work it in there somehow. Who knows? But I'm sorry I, I read that those you went things. through that. Huh? I'm sorry that you went through that. Yeah. Um, I was a victim advocate for many years with the police department down in South Carolina. So I knew I, I've been trained to deal with trauma. It's been a long time, but I've been trained to deal with trauma. I was also a reporter. Um, but yeah, but it's it's been odd reading this stuff, some of the blog posts I wrote, which were mainly private, trying to capture stuff from my story. And it's like, I don't want to read this. Yeah, I get that. So. I get that. I haven't written about, I haven't written about my son's NICU experience at all. Yeah. And I have pages and pages and pages from the NICU and I would just sit there in the NICU all day. Um, but, and I haven't been able to do it. I, yeah. I may do it one day, but I think it took me five years to write about my stroke. Um, so sometimes it takes a little bit of distance. Yeah, you have to put some perspective. By the way, you should have added a picture of your son today in your thing so we could see him. But yeah, it's a good thing that you made all those notes because one day you're probably going to want to write about it and it would help a lot of people who, uh, my cousin had a, a son who was born premature. They had to take him because she was dying. And uh, he was on one of those heart monitors. Yeah. To this day, when I hear beeps, I'm like, it could just be any kind of anything, alarm, stove, and I'm like, yeah. Yeah, it, it takes you right back. It does. Okay. Kaifel, how are we on time? I want to be respectful, but I also want to give folks a chance to keep chatting if we have some. Uh, we are open on time if people need to 
uh, leave, drop out, they can. Uh, but if the if you want to keep having the conversation, we are good to keep having the conversation as well. Okay. Can I ask, um, besides writing, uh, also there's audio, uh, which I know for several different occasions, I resorted to recording conversations and not worrying about trying to write everything down at the point, not knowing what would actually be useful. Um, because honestly, family history and or other things, um, whether it's mine or someone else's, it can feel like dirty laundry at that certain stage. You know, it's like, who, like you said, who would want to read this? You know, it's, or can I read other people's stories yet about certain things? Um, so I, I just discovered that, that having the audio is a, is a good backup uh, and pictures, because sometimes that connects me to a different aspect of what was happening in the moment. Like I'm a, an observer, a third party observer. And I found that fascinating what one sees afterwards or what one hears from a conversation afterwards that you didn't capture at the point. Um, I'm just mentioning it. These are micro cassettes and phone, re phone recording. And, uh, you know, sometimes I would try to gauge if, if the person looked uncomfortable while I was doing it or if they were just wondering what the contraption was. <laughs> so. I can also help you capture that the emotion and other aspects of the, the conversation. Or if you, you go somewhere to something that brings on these emotions and you record it, then you can hear that stuff in your voice and capture it later. Because sometimes in the heat of the moment, the emotion uh, seems pretty powerful. And then when you get away from it, it's like, oh, it wasn't that big a deal until you hear that in your own voice and you realize, yes, it was. Denial, I live by the river of denial. <laughs> well, if you're like me, I um, absolutely hate the sound of my voice. <laughs> you're like, who's that? Is that mine? Yeah, that's how you sound. I understand. Harry, I was thinking about, actually this came up this week in a conversation. I was talking to a friend about listening to podcasts and they recommended like this long list of true crime podcasts. And there are a couple of people on the call who may have had this experience. I don't know if it, I doubt it's unique to me. And, but having worked in a position where I was either researching or working on true crime stories, um, like now I can't do it. Like I can't watch them. I can't listen to it. You know, just this kind of weird, um, I hate to use the phrase secondary trauma because I know it has a specific clinical context, but you know, I kind of feel like that's a possibility. And I think it has to be true for reporters, especially ones who are in, you know, reporting on things that are hugely traumatic, like things that have happened in the last year. I mean, I think about, you know, the, in the coming years, like how many healthcare professionals are going to need mental health care because of what they've lived through this year. So I think as, I mean, is that something that the Carter Center looks at, like with, with the work that you all do, or do you have, I guess, just comments on that? Yeah, you know, in, in 2019, we had plans for what we were going to do in the following year, and then COVID happened, and, um, you know, suddenly the priority shifted from training journalists on reporting on mental health to supporting journalists' mental health because so many folks were affected. And like the last year has been particularly tough, but it come on the heels of like four years, four previous years or five previous years of just like sheer nonstop everything. Um, and I think since the election before this one, like the year before that, you know, the previous election. Um, so that was like 2015, I think, has, since 2015, journalists have been running nonstop. So yeah, I mean, like we have 
we ran nonstop trainings last year to help journalists with their mental health. And we're working this year with some organizations on creating some mass, massive online courses for journalists on protecting their mental health because it's so important. Um, and because journalists are in the public eye, uh, whether you're bylined or like you're actually on TV or on the radio um, and other media, of course, but um, you know, you're, you're in the public eye and especially if you're female journalists and journalists of color are targets for folks online. And so it adds this extra dimension of being unsafe generally and generally in the work that you do. And like at the time that I left journalism, um, they had beefed up security at the building that I worked at because they were concerned that someone would try to bomb the building. And so it's like walking into work every day and not knowing if today was gonna to be the day that somebody is gonna try, try to break in and shoot the shoot up the building or blow up the building or our live crews in the streets were getting attacked by people. So um, yeah, journalists have had a tough time. And I think the last year has just exacerbated a lot of the issues that existed before um, and added, you know, the racial the excess, I would say the excess of racial violence because it was it existed before, but also the worries about your health and your safety and that of your parents and your friends and your family because now everybody is the story, including the people you care about. So yeah, I mean, we often call journalists the first responders and it's true, uh, one of the first responders because um, the secondary trauma is real. And I just wanna say one more thing. Um, you know, someone told me early on that when you send somebody out to cover the game of baseball, you at least make sure that they have a fundamental understanding of baseball. And we send young reporters out to cover stories without a fundamental understanding of trauma and vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. And so you have, you know, these early twenties folks going out to cover, you know, um, car accidents, fatal car accidents or interviewing grieving family members without even really having a concept that they're bringing the grief home with them. And um, it's, yeah, I would say, <laughs> I read a study today that essentially was like 5,000 words of the journalists are not okay. And another thing along with that is that journalists, by the nature of their job, are required to be objective about what they're reporting on. And some of this stuff, I don't see how people are, can be objective. Um, you know, that's going on in the world. And like she said, if they've got family members who are sick or a lot of this racial violence that's going on, you know, you have to keep your emotions back about how you feel about that. And I would hate to be covering that stuff right now because I wouldn't. It's just like Stuart and I were talking about this idiot up in Cock County who was posting stuff that he shouldn't have even been thinking, let alone posting about the people he works with, the children. And, you know, that would be very hard. So that adds another layer. You can't do anything about it. And yet you're reporting on, on this guy who's gonna go out and do what he does. I think that makes it hard. It makes yeah, it hard for me sitting here watching it on TV and knowing there's not anything I can do or feeling like I can't. Well, the, the, the argument, the discussion about objectivity and journalism is a whole can of worms. <laughs> it's a whole can of worms that I won't even get into. Um, and the impossibility of even being objective and, um, and the privilege of objectivity.
Thank you, Cindy. <clears throat> Anyone have any other thoughts they want to share? I think just thank you. This has been important and really good. Yes. Thank you for having me. I think it was yes. very, very helpful. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great. I wanted to say to Kit, hi to Kat Robson, although I don't see her. She's on. I know, but I don't see her. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. That was quite enlightening. You're very welcome. I was really glad to join you today. Yeah. And also, I don't get spend enough time with with writers as I should. I just operate in a little vacuum. So it's nice to be among friends. It's a little hard to spend time with us since none of us wants to talk. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and I'm one of those who talks too much. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say some of us do. Thanks, Carrie.